You are listening to This is Oklahoma, hosted by Mike Hearn, telling stories of Oklahomans and those that have made it their home. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of This is Oklahoma. Mike Hearn here, your host, back with another episode. Exciting news. This podcast is presented by the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, who have been telling Oklahoma's story through its people since 1927. Follow them online at oklahomahof.com, and then definitely follow them on Instagram for all the information that you need, because I'm sure that's where you follow us as well, at oklahomahof. Let's get into today's episode. Sat here with uh, Les Thomas Sr. So you have a junior then, right? Yes, sir. I have a son. I have a son. I can't tell you his age. That'll give my age away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, uh, man, I appreciate you taking the time out today. I know you're a busy man. Um, yes, sir. Thanks for I having guess me. I guess most of, most people listening would know you as voice of OSU games on the field. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm bring the crazy. a lot of energy. Yeah, yeah. For some reason, they trust me with a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> How... Uh, I mean, how, how'd you how'd you get into that stuff? Like, did you go to OSU growing up? No, so um, I've been a fan since the late 90s. Several of my friends played football there. That's what made me become an OSU fan. Okay. And then um, I want to say maybe 2014 or so, um, I started doing chapel for the football team on uh, at home games. Uh-huh. And um, so on game day, I would come in, bring an inspirational word, and then... I believe it was Ramon, Ramon Richards, because um, I would do music, too, because I'm an artist. Yeah. Um, so Ramon was like, you should do a song for OSU. And, um, man, when he said that, it just hit me like, duh, why haven't you done a song for OSU? Right. So I did Let's Go Pokes. Um, and when I did that, it opened up the doors with the administration um, outside of football. And, um, and I was at a basketball game, and uh, a lady walked up to me, and she was like, um, um you know, you are you be less, and I was like, yes, ma'am, I'm be less. And um, um, she asked me if I if I had uh, announced before, and I said no, I had never been an announcer. And uh, but I said, but I don't shy away from a microphone. You right. Know? I travel and do motivational speaking. I do music. I rap. So um, anyway, long story short, she asked me, was I interested in trying out? Because uh, Matt, the guy who was doing a great job before me, he had resigned from the position, and. Uh, um, she asked me, did I want to try out? Long story short, four months later, I'm trying out uh, in front of six people in Boom Picking Stadium, man. Yeah. And uh, they gave me the script the day before. No, oh, no way. <laughs> six people as well? Six people, man. I tried out in front of six people. Yeah. Um, they, they told me the week before that they was going to send me the script. Man, they sent me the script the day before. And um, I'm just, a, um, I'm a perfectionist. Right. And I didn't want to read off of a script. And they said, man, we don't expect you to to memorize this thing, you know, just kind of be familiar with it. And um, I used to do stage plays, so I have this remedy that I use to remember things. Mm-hmm. And, uh, man, they gave me – the script had about five or six paragraphs. It's not like one or two sentences. Man, I somehow stored that in my brain in under 24 hours. Wow. And I went in there in front of six people and tried out. And man, I mean, I didn't skip a beat. I, I'm still surprised. You can tell in my voice how I'm talking right now. Like the whole thing. The whole thing. I stored it in my memory bank and I said it without looking at the paper and they could not believe that um, I memorized. Yeah. Memorized. And I did, you know, somehow, somehow I did. But anyway, that's how I got it. And um, a couple of people tried out. And um, honestly, I was really scared and nervous. I don't know if you ask for all this information, but um, I was really scared and nervous. Um, even though I had been in front of people, like doing music is kind of different. You know what you're going to say. My man, in front of 60,000 people. I mean, I've been a fan at that time. I had been a fan like a little, maybe around 15 years or so. Yeah. And it's like, man, I would have a microphone in front of 60,000 people. Uh, and I don't really get nervous and scared, but I was really nervous at when the opportunity presented itself. And um, I was almost okay with saying that I almost had it. Yeah. Like if I wouldn't, yeah. if I wouldn't have gotten it, I could. I just would have bragged to my friends and family, saying, "Man, I was almost the game day host." Right. Yeah. So, so that's how it happened. What was that first game like? Who was that first game? Um, the first game, mm, man, that's three years ago. Let me see. I want to say it was um, one of those Louisiana teams. Okay. Um, I just remember. 
the first game was unreal. The and, and honestly, the first season, mm-hmm. it's still unreal right now. Even right now, I tell my wife, man, can you believe? I, I mean, there's days where I just like it just hit me, babe. Can you believe I'm the game day host for Oklahoma State? So, but that first year was I I wasn't relaxed. Um, I was really intense. Wanna I got to make sure I say everything right. Yeah, and um. Uh, it was just unreal, man. The very first time I did Orange Power, I just really thought I was going to pass out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because I just, you know, you know, I pack a lot of energy, man. And just like, oh, just now I can lead the Orange Power chant. Yeah. Oh, God, what is this that's going on? And um, but yeah, man, I mean, that, that first game. I just remember having to go to the restroom a couple of times. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, before I went out there um, and everybody says, man, you see so you seem so comfortable. I'm like, I am comfortable, but I get nervous just like anybody right. else. Right. Yeah. yeah. We had uh, I had Malcolm Tubbs on the podcast. Yeah. And Malcolm was saying like the first time he went out to his first Thunder game when he, they were in Tulsa. Yeah. And he's like words just they wouldn't come out like and the guy's in his ear like you can speak now and now obviously he's down at OU doing the yep. game day stuff at OU so yeah. that's, that's awesome that's a big deal yeah. that's cool that's awesome you guys know each other and, and uh, can bounce back some stuff for sure but um, so let's go let's go back like were you born and raised here? Yes, I'm born and raised in Oklahoma City. Okay. Yes, sir. And then brothers, sisters? So um, yeah um, I have two older brothers and one younger brother um uh, grew up with my two older brothers in the same house. We actually grew up in Midwest City. Mm-hmm. And um, um, uh, mom and dad, but my mom raised me um, pretty much single parent, you know, mm-hmm. tough childhood, you know. Um, that's one That's one reason I love to share my stories because um, I had a really tough childhood and I was blessed to be able to make it out of that and do something positive with my life. But yeah, man, uh, brothers, I'm, I'm married. I've been married 19 years. It will be 20 in June. Um, son and daughter, Les the second, yeah, and our daughter uh, Layla. Uh, uh, they are twenty one and seventeen, and um, man, Air Force. Mm-hmm. Was you served in the Air Force, man? Twenty years. Wow. Yeah. So growing up, like you, like I said, you pretty tough childhood growing up. Um, yeah. Is that kind of how like the music scene came into you growing up through childhood? Like with, you said, you know, you're an artist, you're a rapper. Where, where does yeah. that fit in as well? Um, well, music, you know, growing up having my brothers playing, um, I grew up in a very religious home, man. And so my brothers would have to sneak and play music when my mom, when my mom was gone. And um, drums is my first love. I played the drums, my okay. brothers played the drums. So that was the first, um, uh, I guess, uh, being introduced to music was through the drums. We beat on pots and pans. And then, you know, back then in the 80s, that's when hip hop was really taking off. And so, um, uh, so when I was, this is a, this is a fun fact that I, I mean, I've done a, I've done several podcasts. I've never said this before. <laughs> exclusive. So here this is exclusive go. right here. <laughs> I actually was in a rap group yeah. <laughs> in middle school. Okay. I went to Rogers Middle School. Uh, as previous to me getting kicked out of school. Yeah. Uh, but um, I went to Rogers Middle School, and um, well, I was in a rap group called Reality. <laughs> and uh, my name was Lemon Drop. Lemon Drop. <laughs> Lemon Drop. And my friend, uh, my best friend, Michael, his name was Chocolate Drop, and we had two other rappers in it called Reality. I mean, we was uh, shopping our music to, um, to all kind of record labels and everything, and... Um, I actually even kind of remember my rap. That's that's a shame, <laughs> but yeah. So um, so anyway, yes and no. It, it came from the the, the tough childhood. Um, it helped produce lyrics for my music. Mm-hmm. You know, because a lot of times um, we let our, our pain various ways, and and music was a was a avenue for me to um, just write about reality, my life. And um, so, yeah, that kind of introduced me to it between my brothers with music and then um, growing up as well uh, around that and then being in a rap group in middle school. And then I let rap go, rap go for a long time. I, mm-hmm. I wasn't like a kid that just was in the lunchroom rapping. I don't have that story. Somebody beating on the on the lunchroom table. I really yeah. wasn't that guy. Drums was my life. I loved drums and I loved acting. And then um, uh, I got back into rapping, I guess, around... Uh, 2002, 2003 is when I okay. started rapping again. So raised in quite a religious home, was 
were you were you doing music at church as well? Were you playing drums at church and stuff? Yes, yes, I played the drums. I still remember the very first time that my um, my my mom I played so I played with my brothers. They were in the marcha band. Um, that's where I got the foundation. And then once one time, my church was having like a a um, like a talent show or something like that, and I didn't enter it. And then uh, my mom just in front of everybody, she was like, she stood up. She was like, "Let's get on the drums." And so I had to get on the drums. Yeah. I just remember my heart going 100 miles per hour. I remember being off beat, and I never hit the bass drum. I just was using my hands, hitting the snare and the hi hat. Um, but when she did that, man, it just opened up the floodgate, man. Because I'm like, I really have a gift, and it's really not as scary as it seems. Right. And um, so yeah, man. Um, uh, growing up, I was grew, I grew up playing the drums in church, and I was really good. I actually played professionally at six, 16, 17, 18. Whenever a gospel artist would come in to uh, Oklahoma, a lot of times I would be the drummer that would play for him. Okay. Yeah. So you're obviously very, very good at it. Oh, yeah, yeah, man. I, I tell people all the time, um, I'm a very humble guy. Yeah. Um, but when it comes to the drums and cooking out, I kind of lose my humility. Yeah. Uh, because I was really, 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 really good. <laughs> <laughs> I was one of those drummers with an attitude. I knew I was good. I mean, kind of like Drumline. That's my life, too, because I really love the marching band, being mm-hmm. in a um, historical black college where you did all the tricks with the drumsticks and, yeah, and all that. Yeah, that's unbelievable how you do that. Yeah, man, I, I can still... I had my drumsticks out last night, yeah. and my wife was just staring at me. It, it almost like took us back to 20 years ago, how she looked at me when I played the drums then. It was like a cool moment, because I hadn't really picked up sticks in a while. Yeah, But yeah, yeah. so I, I grew up playing in the church and in the marching band, yeah. Yeah, and so you played at college as well then? Yes, sir. So I, uh, I'm going to cut this on silence. So I, um, I, uh, I went on, I went to Millwood High School. I grew up in Midwest City, um, got kicked out of school in seventh grade, so I transferred to Midwest High School. That's where I graduated from, and um, I was in a band there. And then I went to Southern University uh, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Okay. Um, that was the first college I went to. I lasted about a month and a half, um, got into a big fight. And uh, as you could tell, you know, I had some some childhood trauma. Yeah. Trauma. And, um, uh a lot of hazing goes on, and, um, you know, I wasn't for anybody hazing me at that time, you know. And uh, so I went to Southern, and then I got into um, some some problems there. Came back and went to Langston University, mm-hmm. uh, and I played in the band at both of those schools, and um, the that was my life. But when I came back to Oklahoma, it forced me to face who, um, what was my identity. I really had an identity um uh, it impacted my life on like outside of band because one day drums will end because in the beginning it was just drums. One day drums will end. What will be your your identity then? And so I came back and went to Langston, man. And then I had our son. That's why I went to the Air Force because I, gotcha. we had our son. And since my dad what didn't really play a, um, a, a huge role in my life as a young person, um, I, I made a vow to my uh, at that time fiance that. Um, I will be able to provide and make sure that I'm there in the life of my yeah. son. So that's why I entered the Air Force. So why Air Force? Um, well, actually, man, I mean, it's a funny story, man. I'm going to make it short as possible. Uh, I was at, at that time, my girlfriend, Mary, I was at her house, um, which is my wife now. Um, and, and a good friend that I grew up in church and he went to Millwood, he came over there, you know, he thought he was Tupac. He came over there and and the tank top is pretty funny. He really actually looked like Tupac, and he thought he was Tupac reincarnated. But <laughs> um, he came over there to to um, to holler at her to, to you know get a digits to see what's up, you know, try to make her his girl. And he saw me over there. He was like, "Les, what's up?" I'm like, "T, what's up?" You know. Yeah. And he was telling me about that time how much money he was making and how he was in the Air Force. And um, I was like, "Boom!" I mean, that was it. Wasn't a thing of now. I come from a a family of military people, but most of them are army. My mm-hmm. dad was army. His brothers was army. My cousins army. My oldest brother went to the army. Uh, but it was just it wasn't a thing of man. I like our Air Force over anything else. Uh, but once I got in, I understood that the Air Force I fit that 
um, profile more than anything else okay. because Air Force is really about paying attention to detail. So it was like right time, right place. It was right time, right place. I mean, he talked to me. Um, we were having our son, and I'm like, I was working at Mathis Brothers, and I'm like, I know I can't do that forever. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I really wasn't college material, and I didn't want to wait three or four years to make money. And who's to say I would make money in three right. or four years? So right time, right place. He, he introduced me to the Air Force, and and. Uh, one of the best things that ever happened to my to my life was joining the Air Force. Um, it really changed the trajectory of my life. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what did you do in the Air Force? So in the Air Force, I was an accountant. You know, mm -hmm. it's pretty funny because um, I really like to look at people's uh, reaction when I say that because accountants are usually, I mean, now I'm not putting accountants in the box, but, <laughs> but usually. Then we can't all be Ben Affleck shooting people, right, and killing people. That's <laughs> yes, like, yes, exactly. That's what every accountant dreams to be. <laughs> But usually, you know, they're a little bit more reserved or, um, um, you know, out, not as outgoing. And I'm, I'm loud. Right. I'm crazy. I'm the life of the party. I have a lot of energy. Um, but, yeah, I was an accountant. I mean, math was the only subject I was good at growing up. And um, that's what I did in the military for 18 years. But a, a year and a half of that, well, two years of that, I was a chaplain assistant. Mm -hmm. um, and so and then I went back to finance. And uh, so I did accounting. And so, yeah. And I deployed in everything as an accountant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's interesting that, like, you, did you just naturally take the math? Because when you speak to most kids or, or just kid, you know, people who grew up, yeah. like, I really, I just didn't like math, so I sucked at it. Yeah. You know? Oh, and I sucked at it because I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> One I of got those. you. Yeah. Well, um, in sixth grade, uh, well, I noticed that I was, I, I, I learned it pretty easily. But in sixth grade, um, I had a teacher that noticed that I had a gift in math. And um, she she actually started working with me more and more and then put me in a math competition um, to the point where I ended up representing Oklahoma um, against other kids in other states in math competitions yeah. in sixth grade. So I just took to it naturally. It wasn't a thing that I love to do or it wasn't a thing of, oh, I'm going to master this. I'm going to put all the effort in. It was just I just had a natural ability. It's almost like, you know, it's kind of funny because I'm not I'm not the most articulate person in the world. So it's like. I mean, I'm great in math, but my English is horrible. <laughs> <laughs> my grammar is bad, but hey, hey, you can give me some paper you give and me I, some can, numbers, I yeah. can do some numbers with a pencil without a calculator. Yeah, you know, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I don't uh, know if I could do it now, but then I could. When you, you said you did 20 years in, in the Navy, uh, sorry, in, in, in the Air Force, yes. um, and you, you deployed a few times yeah, for I that? Yeah, I deployed. So I deployed to Kuwait and Iraq um, 2006. Uh, uh, I don't want to start it off with this, but it's the truth. I miss Thanksgiving. I miss Christmas. Yeah. New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. Um, I deployed. I, I was in Ali Asalim, Kuwait. And um, that was Operation Enduring Freedom. And so um, a lot of times people think the Air Force is just it's just all about the planes. But um, it's under it's less than one percent of the people in the Air Force that fly. Mm -hmm. So many things. No different than the business. When I tell people you think about the Air Force, Think about a business. You have to have people with the money. You have to have the people that clean up. You got to have the people that cook the food. You got to have the people that handle all the paperwork. I mean, the customer service. It's no different than what we do in civilian life. Everything in civilian life has to be taken care of in the military. And so um, every it's, it's no positions really that's non-deployable. Mm -hmm. So over there, um, basically, I was a cashier. So I would um, basically, um, you know, convert money to Kuwaiti dinar or to U.S. dollars, um, you know, and we had to pay bills. You got to pay bills, uh, accounts payable, accounts receivable, mm -hmm. all those things. Because really when you're in another country, we're like we're leasing. We're, you know, those bases aren't permanent. Even though we're building on them, like we're leasing that, we're yeah. renting that from that country. And um, so, you know, um, that's the role I played over there. Yeah. What comes to mind is the scene from the movie War Dogs. Have you seen that movie? I haven't seen it. No, oh, it's with Miles Teller and um, the guy, from, uh, I can't remember his name. Uh, and there's a scene in that movie, they, they deliver these guns to this place in Iraq, and then they get paid while they get there. Okay. But also there's like an accountant sat at a wooden table, and behind him there's just pallets of cash. And he's like, how <laughs> yeah. much do you want? And yeah, he just yeah, kind of yeah. like... I had a drawer of cash, yeah. you know. Um, I assume you didn't have pallets of cash. Yeah, I didn't though. have pallets of cash. Yeah. I had a lot of money. I had I had several million uh, right there in the cage by me, but no, I didn't have. I yeah. didn't have. What was that like going over there? Like, I assume you didn't really travel much growing up. So no, going away, like away from family and away from home, 
especially across, you know, to a yeah. war zone. Like, what, what was that like? Well, um, I didn't realize how, at first I thought everything was fine. I felt good. I felt good about it. I'm like, man, I'm going to serve my country. Um, but on the, on the flight over there, when I got on the plane with um, other service members from, I mean, I feel like I'm just going back to it in my head right now. But when I got on the plane and I saw people in the Marines, the Navy, the Army, so many people in the Air Force, and I saw various ages, man, different uniforms, that's when it hit me, man. Yeah. When I got on a plane on a big 757, seeing all these people in the military, I'm like, wow. I'm like, this is real. And so um, I remember um, Talladega Nights helped yeah. me out. Thank you, The Will. movie? Yes, sir. Thank you, Will Ferrell. Thank you, Will Ferrell. The movie Talladega Nights helped me out because it just brought a calm over me, and I laughed so hard. Like, I watched that movie over and over and over. I mean, you know, I'm thinking about the part right now when he was doing the interview and his hands kept on coming up <laughs> in the screen. Like, that movie was hilarious. Thanks again, Will Ferrell. And uh, so, um, but yeah, so, and then it hit me that, you know, that was going on, and and um, I don't really, you know, growing up, because I grew up in a really tough or bad neighborhood, um, my anxiety level was up pretty high while I was over there because being over there with um, foreign people, I don't know their language. I don't, you know, they can talk where I can't understand right. them. It was a tough, tough adjustment for me um, because I just didn't feel safe, man. And um, I wasn't used to, in Oklahoma, we're kind of sheltered. Um, you know, we don't have a lot of uh, various nationalities here. And um, there it's like a melting pot. And so I'm interacting and talking to people, and um, I'm, uh, I remember I didn't even want to drink Gatorade bottle because it had four, it had it was written in Arabic. Yeah. And I'm like, man, I'm not drinking this Gatorade because I don't know if something's been done to it or whatever. <laughs> and so um, uh, it was a challenge, man. And then being away from my family, man, um, man, I remember a week after I was there, our fence fell and our dog got out, man, and my wife called me. Well, she she didn't call me. I had to call her. Yeah. Um, but she emailed me and I called her and I mean crying because our dog got out and it was it was really tough because um, I'm a family person, you know, um, I'm very intentional with my wife and kids. And um it's really hard on a family, it's hard on you mentally. Um, but if I'm being real with you, um, while I was there, um, God helped me quickly realize that I had a I had an assignment while I was there and some amazing, amazing things happened. They had like a desert idol, um, like American Idol. They had a desert idol. Um, and I remember like three days after I slept for two days, seriously. And then uh, my office entered, entered me in this desert idol. <laughs> um, and at that time, I was in a rap group called Mobsters of Light. That was my first album, Church Shaker. Mm -hmm. And, um, man, they entered me in this desert idol and everyone is getting up there doing. Now, here's the thing. Like in Ali Asalim is really is really established. So they had a legit auditorium with legit sound music, huge stage and everything. And uh, <clears throat> you had to, you know, just it's just like American Idol. And. I'm seeing all these people doing covers and everybody's loving it. And I'm, I'm like, man, I have to do original music, you know, because it's no one's going to not going to know what you. Yeah. yeah. And it's kind of, it's whack for a rapper to get yeah. up there and do a cover. What? I'm not about to get up there and rap nothing but a G thing yeah. or something. Right. You know, a song by Lecrae or whatever. So anyway, I, um, I, uh, man, I had this song called growing pains. It was a song about my life where I talk, talk about my, tough childhood and then how I had to adjust on being a husband and a father in the second verse marriage was was tough for me at first because I, I didn't have that growing up and I didn't see it much so I had to learn how to do that and then it and then in the end of the songs it talks about the triumph about how um, I got to where I'm at now and man I did that song when I tell you it had to be at least 500 people in the auditorium nobody was sitting down yeah. Nobody was sitting down. When I tell you it blew me away, a standing ovation to music they had never heard before. But what it is, they felt they felt the spirit behind the song. They felt they they can just I mean, because you know you know I was running all around the stage oh, and yeah. around and stuff. And um I'll never forget the commander, you know, this guy, I mean, you know, probably fifty five year old, a Caucasian man, and he uh he 
he said some of my lyrics. Like when we got done, they had the judges had to say whatever, and he said, "There's a part in there that say I might have did what they said I did, but I'm not who they say I am." Mm-hmm. And he said that, man. And when he said that, everybody went crazy. But anyway, at that moment, I realized, lest you have an assignment here, um, to just love on people, man. You know, uh, you know, I, I kind of have this. I've been blessed with the ability to just kind of, you know, um, it's not bragging. It's just a gift that God has given me to be able to make people feel comfortable and welcome, man. And so at that, from that moment forward, honestly, it sucked being gone. But knowing that it was something bigger than just serving my country, which is huge already, but also knowing that you're here to impact people's lives and help other people, that's when I was like, okay, I can do this. Yeah. Yeah. I can't imagine the look on their face when they, and obviously like, you know, you're an accountant, but I bet there were people that just only interacted with you as an accountant and saw a little bit of your spark. But then when you, when they saw you on stage, they were like, they was like, that's a what? T- totally different person. <laughs> and, I, and it's like I transformed. You're right. You're right. You know, there was like totally different person. And and over there, you know, I mean, I kind of I kind of hate to compare it to being in jail. Mm-hmm. But when you're deployed, it's almost like being in jail because you you don't you can't go anywhere. And I mean, you're, you're limited to the base. And so anything can like like to them, I was famous. The fact that they could go Google me. They were like, oh, this guy is famous, but they didn't find that out until after I performed. That's when they were like, who is this guy? And it was actually pretty funny, man, because half the base knew me. And, um, you know, and it was just a cool thing to see. But yeah, they were like, whoa. So when people would come to the, when people would come to my counter, they'd be like, hey, man, bust the flow, man. We want to hear something. So I'm in my military uniform, like busting a rhyme, yeah. man. You know, and, uh, look, I mean, thankfully, my supervisor, they were cool with that. They didn't care. You know, they thought it was funny too. Did I, I'm sure that helped, like, just make the time go by a little faster and make every day better yep. with people, like I said, coming to you and knowing that and, like, just, yeah. you know. It did. It did. And, yeah. you know, you give me a platform, man. I'm not really afraid of it. So, I mean, I was standing on a desk and performing, act silly with them. It just, like you said, helping the day pass. Yeah. And, and every one of us, we're away from our family. So anything that can can that can that ease some of that, you know, yeah. is worth it. How long was that tour? That tour right there was three months. Yeah, so I, would, I was gone for three months. And I, at that time, man, the Army had extended from 12 to 15 years. So, I mean, like I told you, it was kind of like being in jail. So people were like, man, how much time you got? How much yeah. time you got left? And I did not want to tell people <laughs> because, you know, there were people that got there before me and was going to be leaving like a year later. Yeah. And I was like, man, uh, oh, man, I'm here to, uh, till uh, January. <laughs> you know, I was saying real low. But yeah. um, that tour right there was three months. And so... um. Yeah, so I couldn't even imagine being gone a year. Right, and then the second tour was that another three month one. As yeah, well? that was three months. At that, so back then, the 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 Air Force really a tour was was pretty much two to four months. They would let you split, so you could kind of split like mm-hmm. you know with someone else. The tour was normally four months. Um, but you could split the time with people. I mean, it's, you can't really, you can't do that now. Yeah. Um, but back then, you could, and that's one thing I loved about the Air Force is um, they try to make sure that everyone wasn't gone as long. Yeah. And then, so how, you know, you, you come home, right, and you go back to just doing Air Force stuff on base here. Yeah. Um, you know, doing account stuff, back to uh-huh. normal life. You could see wife, you could see kids and stuff. Yeah. Um. Well, was there quite a big gap between you going on like on the tours, or were they fairly close together? Um, no, they were they were um, separate. One was two thousand um, to end of two thousand four. The second one was the end of two thousand six. Okay, so it was a break in between both of them, and um, uh, part of the thing that's not talked about in the military is how hard it is on the family that's at home. Because the wife or the husband that's at home, they have to be mom and dad. You know, they have to take care of everything. So, uh, thankfully, I'm, I'm blessed to have a, have a wife that's uh, uh, very understanding and, you know, walks in grace. And so, um, for, for my home, um, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't, like, really hard. Yeah. Um, she had a great support system. Especially the kids were really young then. Yeah, our kids were young. I mean, what, 2004, our kids was seven and yeah. four, something like that. And so um, or maybe six and three. Um, but, yeah, she had a really great support system around her. Um, so uh, the transition was 
was pretty cool. Um, and I grew a lot both times that yeah, I deployed. Yeah, yeah. I, I grew a lot, so. And then, so, you know, you get to a time where you're, you know, you've done your time and you get to come out of the military. What are you thinking, or sorry, come out of the Air Force, what are you thinking, like, when you're coming out? Like, you know, you're planning the rest of your life, right? Your wife's happy to have yeah. you do something else or whatever it is, and, and you get You're talking about when I retired? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah. what, like, you know, what what was that whole, like, planning stage like? You know, man, what, what am I going to get into kind of thing? I couldn't have planned this any better, man. When I tell you that my transition, you see how my posture changed, man, because I'm excited about this. <laughs> this... this this season of life, I'm crazy excited. I didn't have to do anything. Mm. And that's usually not the case. For me, I've always been a dreamer. I always, I've always been a thinker. I've always been a person to evaluate my life and, 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 um, and to, re, to assess my life and, and recreate myself. So I was never really mentally and I wasn't really em- mentally and emotionally attached to the to the military where that was my only thing in life. Uh-huh. Um, I had been doing music. I played the drums for, for a group where we traveled. We played at the Super Bowl. All these things happened. I had released the album. I did stage plays. All these things happened while I was in the military. <clears throat> so when it was time to go, this is what happened. When I, when I knew it was time was coming, I had already been running um, a mentoring program here in, um, under Youth for Christ here in the city. And so um, we're in Millwood, Douglas, John Marshall, uh, Northeast and Centennial before they shut down. Um, so I had been doing that super part time for maybe eight years at the time. And they had already been courting me about coming on full time. Mm-hmm. And so um, I, I thought I had two more years left in the Air Force, but actually it, it um, I got an opportunity to be able to retire early. And so... Man, since they had already been talking to me and talking to me and talking to me, I'm like, man, I'm in the Air Force. I'm not leaving the Air Force for this. You know, I could still work part time and mentor. Um, man, when I got the news that I was retiring and I told them they were elated, they were happy. Like, yes, you can come on full time. So, look, I didn't have to look for that job. And then at the same time, six months before I retired, that's when I got the OSU job. So, I mean, like yeah. both jobs came to me where I didn't have to hustle and fill out job applications. I wonder, man, what am I going to what am I going to do next? Um, this is what I tell people. I pretty much went from from work to purpose. Excuse me, because my 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 um desire in life is to impact the next generation and fulfill my life by just fulfilling my purpose and helping other people. Like I love helping other people. Yeah. I'm I'm real big on the community. And so um the transition for me, you know, was easy. And I almost feel bad when I talk to other people in the military because they have like withdrawals or or you go from this this structure and or people esteeming you a certain way based off of your rank Mm -hmm. to being a regular civilian. I mean, you you know, so for some people, it's really hard. But for me, um, I've always marched to the beat of my own drum and always uh, stayed true to myself. And I don't want to sound like I, I had it. I have it all together. But that part that you're asking about, it was I couldn't have like if. If God would have said, "Man, at five years old, write down what you want to do when you retire from the military," mm-hmm. I couldn't. I couldn't have written it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, going back, you said you played the the Super Bowl. Yeah. So tell me about that, because <laughs> like that's coming up, right? That's like we're in that time of the year now. Like that's yeah. that's a huge deal. Uh, so I I used to play the drums uh, for a group. Man, I'm trying to think. What's the name of the group? Hold on, I'm about to tell you. It's gonna come to me. Uh, ah. Anyway, it's going to come to me. Yeah. So I played the drums for a group and um, based here out of Oklahoma. And it was so cool how it came together. Um, I remember I remember one of the songs was uh, Pressure and Pain. The, the name of the group is going to come to me. I know it is. But um, so I played the drums. And it's this guy that actually played uh, for Motown that lived here. And he played the bass. And then there was a guy that could sing and two that can rap. And the it was like gumbo, man. I mean, and I, and and at that time I wasn't playing the drums, and then they was looking for a drummer, and I was wanting to get back into playing the drums, and uh, I had bought this drum set. We came together, we created some great. Man, this music was before its time. Yeah. I mean, 
we stayed booked in Oklahoma like crazy. But anyway, we had an opportunity. Um, I forgot what Super Bowl it was, but it was 2005, the one that was in Jacksonville. Jacksonville, Jacksonville, Florida. And so um, we were booked, man, to play um, at the Super Bowl. And I, I, Black Eyed Peas was there. And a huge, huge opportunity uh, for us to play there. We didn't have any money. We didn't have any sponsors. So we uh, went there on this super broke down 1942 um, uh, charter bus, man. It was mm-hmm. pretty funny. Uh, and pa- Patriots and Eagles. He, the Patriots won. That's yeah, who it was. That's so, so we were there 2005, and um, Black Eyed Peas was there too. Um, and so um, it was a huge opportunity that we played at the Super Bowl. We played in a couple of clubs as well. Um uh, but that was that was one to remember, and uh, maybe shortly after that, man, I stopped playing uh, the drums for them. But um, they went on to travel um, the world. They did. Uh, they did. When I think about it, it's like ah, man, I, I kind of wish I would have stayed in for a little bit. But um, man, I was just hoping that the name of the group was gonna come to me, man. But uh, so so when when like were you on the field playing? So no 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 no. It was like the fan interaction okay. outside. Yeah, <clears throat> it was the fan interaction. Like they do at Super Bowls, they do concerts outside of the yeah. stadium. Uh-huh. So we got to play outside of the stadium um, on a on a huge huge stage. And um, as you could tell, I have a lot of energy. So man, I like rip my tank top off. I would twirl my sticks. When I would break my sticks, I would like sign them and give them to people. I was for real in my mind. I was a rock star. <laughs> So, like, I literally would, like, kick the cymbals with my foot, man, and twirl my sticks and, and for real, like, rip my shirt off type stuff, man. So, uh, <laughs> I was a show to, a show drummer to say the yeah. least, man. Do you miss that side of things, like the drumming music I, side? I do. I do. I miss it um, because when I played the drums, that's it's not a lot of times where I just really, really feel free because, you know, all of us were like, oh, I'm free, I'm free. But you have something kind of holding you down, or whether it be rules, or whether it be, you know, um, oh, I got to consider what people are thinking, this and that. Man, when I play the drums, that's probably um, the freest. Um, um, at that moment is where I'm like super free, um, and so I do miss playing the drums because my personality, I'm very um, uh, demonstrative and aggressive and like to have fun, and so on the drums it's like man that was an outlet that I do miss. Um, but I started doing that through my music too. Whenever I perform, I'm the guy that to jump on the speakers. I jump over chairs, you mm-hmm. know. Uh, not as much as I used to because you know <laughs> I got old man knees now. But I used to be that guy that would run and do a flip and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And kind of to bring it like to present day, um, you know, you you you're a part of this uh, co-founder of Hope is Culture, right? Yes, sir. So t- tell us about that because that's recent. That's like that's re- recent. really recent. That's super recent, yeah. man. So the end of last year, me and uh, four other people, uh, which is Vernon, uh, Marcus Jackson, Vernon Diaz, Marcus Jackson, David Skidmore, and Michael um, Carnuccio. Uh, we came together. We just wanted to, and all of us play a different role, but we wanted to um, try to raise money to help nonprofits. So I take I take about 50 kids to camp every summer, um, which is, you know, most of the kids we deal with, um, myself and Marcus, are from, uh, at, they're at-risk kids and don't have much fun. So we have to raise the money to take them. Um, and so we said, what can we do? We was thinking of one event. What can we do? Um, to raise money and man within within under 40 days we went from that to starting a complete company to starting a complete clothing line um, to help us to be able to raise money for the community so hope culture is about us um, being light man just being light in the city and bringing hope to the city when a person lose hope man I mean when you don't have hope I mean what do you have really and so we just want to be able to spread the love of hope um, through our entire city. And, um, you know, it's almost like uh, someone compared what we're doing to maps just without politics. Um, and so um, right now, you know, it's hopeculture.us. We call it dot us on purpose. Hopeculture.us. Um, half of everything that anyone purchased goes to the community. Half of if you if you pay twenty dollars for a t shirt, ten dollars go to the community, and you say what less? What does the community looks like? It's about 
um, helping the widow, the widow mom or dad um, that has kids and they need help in their home. They need help with the electricity. It's the kids that um, need scholarships to go to school. It's that entrepreneurial that may have a business and say, you know what? I have this business that I want to get off the ground. Um, it takes 30000 but I only have 20000 um, I need 10000 Um So it's helping that. Um, so it's, it's various things. Uh, in the community uh, and other nonprofit organization that's boots on the ground that's really making a difference mm-hmm. with no attachment. That's the thing is our motive is so pure and we just want to be a beacon of light and help people um, that, you know, we, we're getting, we did a soft lunch. That's what I was saying under 40 days. Yeah. We did a soft lunch in December and man, we had 80 people, 80 people there. Some of the most influential people here in the city were there And um, it just happened so quick. And um, it's moving right now. I mean, we had a meeting today. Um, We have something coming. uh, uh, We want to, let me tell you this. So we want to impact 10%. Mm -hmm. It takes 10% to start a revolution. It takes 10% to change anything. If I walk into Walmart and they hire me today, if I I can influence 10% of the employees to to dislike a supervisor or to like a supervisor, that's usually where everybody will, everyone will follow that. Mm-hmm. And so our goal is to we have you know six hundred and thirty four thousand people here in the city. We want to impact ten percent of the people uh, by by inspiring them um, to wear hope culture merchandise um, and to the and just to infuse them with hope. And like I said, 50% of everything that comes in goes into the community. It's just being the hands and feet, man. It's just being a blessing to our our city. That's what hope culture. So hope is the culture. That's pretty much what it's about. Mm -hmm. And your shirt is your flag. You know, uh, we talked about the military in the days of old. Whenever you conquered land, you planted a flag. You had a certain ceremony to plant the flag. So basically, you know, our t- the T-shirt or the hoodie or the hat, whatever you're wearing, is the flag. You know, yeah. just saying, I I represent hope in my city. Yeah. And then is there going to be like a full event launch coming? You said a soft launch. When's the full one coming? Yeah, so <clears throat> we're working towards having a huge event in August. Okay. And so we did a soft launch in December. We're looking at having an event in February. So basically it'll be... It'll be an event every quarter leading up to yeah. August. That's our whole point okay. is to lead up to August. So we have we had a soft lunch. Then we're going to have something around Valentine's Day. Um, then we're going to we're actually um, partnering partnering with um, Oklahoma City Public Schools. That's going to be a big thing. That yeah. I don't want to let the cat out the bag yet, but that's going on in May. That's huge. Um, so we're going to have several several events. Like I'm doing an album release um, in March. Um, Hope, Hope Culture will sponsor that as well. So it's just various things just to uh, tap into various things in the city up to our big event in August. Yeah. yeah. And and you were saying, you know, you do a lot of things. You're a motivational speaker and you do the OSU game days and stuff. And also now that you like said you, you, you have an album coming out, you're yeah. still doing a lot of music stuff. Yeah. Uh, I assume that's never going to end. Right, it's what it's not going to end. Like that's <laughs> a huge passion of yours. That's going to you're going to keep doing it. Yes, yes. So, so music will end at some point. I'm actually thinking um, this album will be my fourth album. I'm thinking it may be my last album. Um, it won't be my last music that I do. There's right. a difference. So that's what I meant. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So, um, um, everything you're right. Everything that I'm part of right now, OSU, um, Hope Culture. I mentor in the community, you know, that type of thing. Uh, thing. I'm, I'm actually writing a book right now, too. Um, mm-hmm. I know I don't I want to seem like, oh, man, he's doing everything. But I'm at a point in my life when I retired, I said it's time for me to reinvent myself and mm-hmm. I challenge myself to pour, empty myself out. And so um, everything that I'm part of now, I plan on continuing it, just that with music. I know at some point in time, I don't want to – I know Jay-Z is – 40 whatever, 47, 48 rapping. I don't want to be 47, 48 yeah. rapping. It's just, you know, I'm kind of from the era that at some point you have to let it go. And um, I'm 41, even though I know I don't look it. I'm just, <laughs> uh, but I'm 41. And so um, um, this album is actually going to be, it's called Vertical. I believe it'd be my best album that I'm done to. Uh-huh. Yeah. Just like a fine line, right? Fine wine, it just get better, it gets better and gets better. And um, it's taken me three years. Yeah. The other albums, I did them in under six months. 
each one, which is like lightning speed, super fast. This one has taken me has taken me three years, and it, part of that is just because I'm involved with so many things. Now. A lot more so, meaning in it. Yeah, a lot more, a lot more meaning, and um, usually an album can kind of when you do an album fast, it can it can almost kind of sound the same. What I love about this album is, man, track one to track thirteen or fourteen be totally different. It yeah. just depends on what what um what season I was you know in, in in my life you know and my last two songs Freedom and and Team America they were very very uplifting songs so we'll see yeah and that's so that's Christian based rap yeah so I do mm-hmm. Christian based rap um I consider myself a Christian rapper uh for sure um you know some of the things like when I did my song Freedom that was more so about current events that's happening mm-hmm. um uh, that song was more so about just to kind of address like um you know shootings and things like that and then team america was more about like man we need to unify even though my brother and sister may not look like me may not believe like me um may not talk like me but that doesn't mean we can we have to hate each other and so um yes i'm a christian based rapper and uh yep that's what i do be uh before we go i want to talk about the recent post that you just put on instagram because i'm a car guy Okay. And okay. I see the bright orange. Yeah. Is that Camaro? America's brightest orange. America's you know? brightest orange Camaro. Yeah. Well, no, it's a Pontiac Firebird. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> man, I, I'm really, really into old cars, and um, uh, I've owned a '71 Mustang and a '73, and I'm really a Ford guy. So yeah. you're looking at that Pontiac is. So it, this it, is you, different for you, you then. Yeah. So different. When I say it's different. I struggle with it when yeah. I when I went to look at it. I'm like, it's not a Ford. It's right. not a Ford, and uh, I'm just one of those guys that's loyal. I wear Adidas, and I'm a you know. Yeah. I just anyway. So, um, so anyway, my mother, um, she she passed in t- 2010 from cancer, mm-hmm. and um, she uh, left my brothers and I an investment, and um, recently um, that paid out, and so. I'm like, you know, I want to get something um, where I can say my mo- my mother got this for me. Gotcha. And she knows that her sons absolutely love the old cars, man. We we love. I mean, my little brother he has a '71 Pontiac Firebird, and um, my other brother has a '72 Cutlass. So anyway, man, um, shout out to my little brother. He found it in Kansas. And with it being orange, I think he knew what he was doing. Yeah. You know, because he's a Chevy guy. He's a Pontiac. So so he's bragging right now that he talked his older brother into... He's taking you away from Ford. Yeah, taking me away from Ford. But, man, this thing is clean. Um, it has a 400 in it. Now, I'm going to have to learn all the... Um, I learned, I know everything about Ford, so I'm having to learn. Yeah. So forgive me if I say it wrong, but it has a 400 in it. Um, the engine was recently rebuilt, man, about six grand into the engine. And uh, the the car is in really really good shape, you know, um, and it's orange, so yeah. you know it's going to one hundred percent be an OSU vehicle. This is know? this is the new game day vehicle. This is, you know, I just might pull up to Boom Picking Stadium in this car. Yeah, <laughs> I can't get it on the field, <laughs> but I can <laughs> just least, once, just a one just photo once. shoot. Yeah, That's yeah, all you yeah. need. Yeah, I may have to drive it in the, um, when we do the homecoming parade or something like that, but. Uh, but yeah, yeah, man. I just recently got it. I purchased it this past weekend, and and uh, it it mean a lot. It means a lot to me. It's sentimental, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, man. I'm looking forward to uh, really get it going. And it's fast, man. I yeah. mean, kick you back in the seat fast. You stomp on that thing, and it's like throw your head back. Yeah, man. I gotta have that power. Yeah, you gotta have that power. That's awesome, man. Well, I you know I really appreciate you giving up the time to come on the podcast, share your story, talk about OSU, you know, talk about going in the Air Force, and and you know. Dropping an exclusive of you having a having a rap yeah, career in yeah, middle yeah. school reality uh, reality man that was like eighty five or something yeah. like that eighty no 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 that would have been ninety one ninety one yeah ninety ninety one no we appreciate it and I know all the listeners appreciate it and now they'll have a lot more context when they see you at OSU games on the microphone you know with your orange glasses or you know at, at basketball games or whatever it is so yeah. how can people reach out how can they follow you and also how can they help with Hopus Culture as well. Okay, um, so um, you can you can follow me on uh, Instagram as Les Thomas Senior um, Sr. 
And then my Twitter and my Facebook uh, fan page is Bless the Mic with one S. B L E S T H E M I C. I'm in the process of switching everything over to Les Thomas Dot Senior. Um, but that's that's how you can contact me. My email is um Les Thomas OKC at gmail.com. And then how you can help is um one I'm always looking for mentors to help me with young people over here on the east side of Oklahoma City. And then Hope Culture, um, you can follow us at um, hopeculture.us. Um, that is hopeculture.us. Our website is hopeculture.us. Instagram and Twitter is hopeculture.us. Um, and you can help us by, like I said, um, by purchasing a T-shirt. You know, if you're about, hey, I want to be able to um, help with planning hope in my city. Or if you say, you know what, I may have an avenue where we can, um, you know, collaborate on some things. Um, please reach out to us. That is hopeculture.us. Remember, everything that you purchase, whether it be a hoodie like the hoodie I have on now, um, the hat, T-shirt, 50 percent, 50 percent. That's not after bills are paid. Mm -hmm. 50% from the, the jump off the top goes into the community. Awesome. Yes, sir. Oh, man, I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for listening, guys. And I'll put all the links that Les just described down below so you can easily go down and click on them and get involved. And we will see you next episode. Cheers. Thank you. This podcast was presented by the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, who've been telling Oklahoma's story through its people since 1927. Follow them online at oklahomahof.com and definitely on Instagram at Oklahoma HOF. Thank you for listening. We are inspired by those around us and hope that you are too. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a review so we can keep telling your stories. For more great Oklahoma content, follow This Is Oklahoma on Facebook and Instagram.